Alright. We'll be doing a lot of work walking through the word here. Flip over to Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, if I put a title on this, it would be the Believer's Positional Authority. And basically what I'm going to be sharing on a little bit is uh, spiritual warfare. And the basic context to begin with is where we're standing at, our position of authority. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. But thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. The thing I want to key on in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 is my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 13. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. I want to key on the phrase. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. One of the basic things that Satan tries to do is keep you from having knowledge. And there's the two principles that he gains, or things that he gains by that principle. First of all, you go into captivity. And what are you going to captivity to? Everything that's of him. Sickness, poverty, you name it, it'll capture you. If it keeps going, it'll kill you. It'll destroy you. And that's what he's saying to Isaiah. You'll go into captivity, and in Hosea, it'll destroy you. Lack of knowledge. Where do you get knowledge? From the Word. A little book here. Most Christians are defeated because they don't know the Word. That's the beginning point of all of it. You've got to know what he says, what you have. If you'll flip over to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Here's the cure for lack of knowledge. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In verse 2 there, we see the cure for Hosea and Isaiah, the two verses there. Renewing of your mind, for what purpose? So that you'll know the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You'll know what His will is. By knowing what His will is, you don't have to pray, if it be thy will, you know what it is. And then you can stand in His will without ignorance. You get that by renewing your mind, and again, you do that by reading the Word. That's how you learn it. If you don't read the Word, you won't know it. John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know the truth. Remember, knowledge was what brought you into, lack of knowledge is what brought you into captivity and destroyed you. Knowledge of the truth will make you free. Free from what? Free from all the things that were capturing you in Isaiah 5.13, the sickness, the poverty, all the things of the devil, knowledge will bring you forth the truth, will bring you knowledge of the truth, will bring you out of that captivity and make you free. And you get that by renewing your mind so that you know what the will of God is. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. 3 John chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. 3 John Chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Here he give us some insight into this knowledge bringing forth a freedom. 3 John chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper 
and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. All right, there's a lot said right here. First of all, they knew the truth. Remember John chapter 8, truth sets you free. But they walked in the truth. They didn't just know it. They applied it. He says, prosper and be in health even as your soul prospereth. Now your soul is comprised of your intellect, your will, and your emotion. The thing that Romans chapter 12 verse 2 told you to renew your mind, that's your soul prospering. As your mind becomes renewed, your soul begins to prosper. As it prospers, you're in health and you prosper in the natural. Now there's three areas of God. There's getting healed when you're sick. Then there's divine health where you never get sick. Then there's divine life where you not only don't get sick, but you minister life and healing to others. Three realms. According to your faith. Faith to faith. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 20. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. This is Paul's prayer. The book of Ephesians is, the, the whole book really, is a book, spiritual warfare. If you read that book, you'll know a lot about spiritual warfare. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He's praying, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. He wants you to understand and know three things. Hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and I want to key on the third one, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight his positional authority, the greatness of his power to us. What power do we have? What authority do we have? He prayed that your understanding be enlightened and that you know these things. Know them so that you won't go into captivity and you won't be destroyed. So the first thing is you have to know it. But knowing the word alone is not sufficient. You must do the word. You must exercise the authority expressed in the word. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. You deceive yourself if you just hear it, and never apply it. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And what he's saying here is there's a mirror. This is your mirror. You look in here, it tells you what you are. It tells you who you are, what authority you have, what your rights are, what the will of God is. You look into it. When you quit looking into it, do you remember and do what it says? There are people who look into it and they forget what they are. They walk away from the mirror and they forget what they are. He's saying, look in there, keep it in your heart. Continue with therein, he says. Know who you are, and you will know who you are and continue in it when you start living it, start practicing it. Knowing it will not do you any good, and unless you exercise what you know, that knowledge alone will not be sufficient. Skip on down there, James chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. James chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. 
Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils believe, also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, old man, wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Again, he's saying basically the same thing. Doing and knowing. You've got to do what you know. You can believe all you want. If you ain't doing nothing, it ain't going to benefit you a bit. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verses 24 through 27. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. This is Jesus talking. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, do things, hear and do, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Again, Jesus here is comparing a wise man to a foolish man. He's saying, you're wise if you know and hear my word, and do them. And you're a fool if you hear them and you're not doing them. If you're not applying what you hear, just hearing it, you're a fool. Now some examples of this is your right to vote. You might not even know you have a right to vote, but you still have it. The fact that you don't have any knowledge of it doesn't cancel out the fact that you got the right. But you can know you have the right to vote. If you don't go down and vote, you don't benefit anything from it. You have to know it, and you have to do it. The Lord showed me it this way, basically. He said, uh, he showed me a big box full of a bunch of presents, my birthday presents, all wrapped up in nice fancy wrapping paper. He said, here's what I've got. All right, here's your box with all your presents in it. And you look at it and say, well, that's a nice box. Boy, look at all them pretty packages. You don't know what's in them. That's a man that doesn't get in here and hear it and know what's in it. Then there's a people who go a step further. They grab out one of those packs and they carry that wrapper off and they go, oh, that's a nice present. It's in the box there. So they open one up and they get one of these gifts out of here and they know it's there. For example, you get a, I unwrap my package on my birthday and I've got a power drill in there, in the box. I say, great, I've got a power drill. But if I never take it out of the box and use it, what has it benefited me? And that's the same thing with the word. There's a lot of people, they know what the package, what's in the package, but they ain't using none of them. They got a bunch of tools, they ain't building a house. It's only knowledge acted upon that will bring results. First, you gotta have the knowledge. You gotta read the word to know what God's given you. And but uh, besides that, as Doug was basically uh, alluding to there, you have to also pray. Just knowing the word prayer is a relationship. And it's kind of like uh, breathing and eating. Praying and the Word. Reading on the Word's eating. Praying and breathing. You quit doing either one of them and you'll die. One of them will kill you a little bit quicker than the other. Okay? But you you got to do both. The Word alone won't sustain you. Prayer alone won't sustain you. A lot of people pray, but they won't read the Word. They won't find out what God's will is. They won't find out their authority. They, and then they won't find out how to use that authority. On the other hand, there's people who know all about the Word, memorize every scripture in the Bible, but they don't pray. You've got to have both. You've got to have a relationship with God through prayer because what that does is get that relationship going and it builds your faith up, that praying. Reading the Word gives you the knowledge. It also builds your faith up. It's God speaking to you by letters He's written to you. You've got to have both. Now I want to move on to bring you some knowledge, show you how to use it. And what I'm talking about tonight is positional authority. Anytime you're going into conflict, you need to know where you stand at in the conflict. I saw a movie one time called Hamburger Hill. I don't know if any of you ever seen it. But it was about a hill in Vietnam. The Vietnamese were on top of it. The Americans were trying to take it. And they were getting slaughtered because the Vietnamese had a good position. They're on top of the hill shooting everybody coming up it. They killed a whole bunch of them and it didn't take many of them to do it. I think about the Alamo. There wasn't very many folks in it, but they was in a good position because they was behind the wall. 
and they wasted a lot of Mexicans. But where we're at is even greater than that because we're above all things. No, no enemy can touch us. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 12 through 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. Now, Doug shared on this Sunday some about the body of Christ being many members, but still being one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Now Christ, as, as Doug shared on Sunday, is comprised of everyone that's born again, including Jesus and including those in heaven that have died on, went on before. If you go on down to verse 27 there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. See, what he's talking about here, Christ is not just Jesus, but Christ is comprised of Jesus and everyone that's a part of his body, all, everyone that's born again. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What he's saying here, he's referring to the believer, ye, which is talking to believers there, as righteousness. He's talking of the unbeliever as unrighteousness. And he's going on down, he's calling the believer light, the unbeliever darkness. As he goes on down, he calls the believer Christ and the unbeliever Bilio. He's talking about believers being Christ. Okay? Christ. And Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, it's not necessary to turn there. I'll read it to you. But I, want, I wanted to clarify that, what I mentioned earlier. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, okay? Somebody passes away, they go to heaven, they're still part of the body of Christ, okay? They don't get tore out of the body just because they died, okay? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 24. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 24. Now let's see where Christ is. Let's see the position of the believer. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 24. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward? And again, I'm going to key on what is his power to usward or in usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and here's our position, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, here he's talking about Christ. First he's talking about Jesus. Where is he? He was raised from the dead, 
set at, his, set at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places, far above all principality, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, everything, every name that is named, not only on this world and that which is to come. Put all things under his feet. Now, Jesus is the head, and we, as the body of Christ, include the feet. The feet's the lowest part of the body. So all these things are under his feet. He hath, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him, Jesus, to be the head. He's the head of that body over all things to the church, which is his body. Jesus the head, the church the body. All of it together is called Christ. Christ means anointed one, okay? But the whole body, you know, your head don't sit over here and your body over there. My head ain't called Terry, my body called Ralph. It's all got the same name, okay? So it's all Christ. It's just two different parts. <laughs> Jesus and the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Just drop down there, next chapter. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 7. And you, happy quickened, which means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who in, is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, or made us alive, together with Christ, by grace are you saved, you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Amen. For what purpose? That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. And how does he do that? By the power he invested in you. Where are we? We're raised up together, made alive together with Jesus, in Christ, made to sit together in heavenly places. Where did Ephesians chapter 1 say that heavenly place was? The right hand of the Father, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, never named is named, not only in this world, but in that which is to come. That's the same place he's seated in the spirit. That's the same place we're seated. God looks at us sitting right the same place Jesus is, far above it all. And that's where you are. That's where you have, that's the power you have, the authority. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus for the purpose that in the ages to come he might show his exceeding riches of his grace that he invested in us. In Ephesians chapter 1 there, that he might show the power to us who believe. In verse 19 there. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 15. Again, we're talking about the body of Christ, including Jesus and the church, is that body, and where positionally we are in our authority, where we're located. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 through 15. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Ye are complete in him, which is the head, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now this passage of scripture falls right in, just elaborating a little bit further on Ephesians 1, 15 through 24, and Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, because here he makes the connection that not only does God look at it as him being raised and placed at the right hand of the Father in heaven in places, a place of authority and power, but that we were raised up with him and placed there. So we, spiritually speaking, the authority we have in the spirit world is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven and places, the same place he's sitting at. In the mind of God, we were raised when Christ was raised. When Christ sat down, we sat down too, right there at the right hand of the Father. And that's where we are now, positionally speaking. That's where our authority proceeds from. We're re seated at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places, far above all principality and power. 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 through 19. 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 through 19. First John 4, verses 15 through 19, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we, in this world, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And I want to keep on verse 17. As he is, so are we in this world. You see, the only way God can manifest authority, and the only way he's ever done it in history, is through people on the earth. You know, he parted the Red Sea, but he did it through Moses stretching forth. He's always done it through a man. There's always had to be somebody either speaking or taking an action. And the only way he can manifest in the earth is through his body that's on the earth. And that's the way his power and authority is, is shown forth. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Remember, as he is, so are we in this world. And where is he and how is he? The right hand of the Father in heaven places far above all friends and power might and dominion, every name that's named. Where are we? Same place. Except we're in this world, but spiritually that's where our authority manifests from. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Now this is Jesus speaking. And this is showing you what he's given us and what's flowing through us from that position we're in. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power... And that word there in the original Greek is the word authority. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always in the world. The thing I want to key on there is verse 18 and 19. All authority is given unto me, he said, in heaven and earth. And then he gives it to us. He says, now you go. Go ye therefore. Here is my authority. I'm going in heavenly places, and so are you with me in the Spirit. And now you take the authority I've got and go. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And keep in mind that all authority that can be exercised upon this earth has to be exercised through the church because Jesus is not here in person in his physical body. We are the body of Christ. And we're the part of Christ that's on the earth. And he manifests through us. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power. And again, that Greek word is authority. I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Now this Greek word here for power is a different word than the other one. One's authority, another one's power, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. 
Now, this is a very important scripture because he's showing you now when he said, Go ye therefore. He said, All power is given, or authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. And now in Luke 10, he's saying, I give unto you the authority over all the power of the enemy. You have the authority over all the power of the enemy. That means the enemy don't have no power over you. You're seated in heavenly places in Christ. Authority is delegated power. Basically, what Jesus has done is give us the power of attorney. And law of power of attorney means uh, a document, I say, give my wife or give Jim. And Jim can go out here and he can take the money out of my bank account. He can sell my land. He can do anything he wanted because he's got my authority. And that's what Jesus gave us. Everything he had, he gave to us. And Satan has to respect that authority. An example of, of authority as opposed to power. Uh, is A good example is a policeman, traffic cop, who's out there directing traffic. And he holds his hand up to stop the flow of traffic. Okay? He ain't got the power to hold all those cars physically. But there's authority invested in that little badge he's wearing of an entire government. And those people respect that authority. When he holds his hand up, he don't have the power to stop him, but everybody will stop because he has authority backed by the government. Same way with us. We hold our hand up to the devil and tell him to stop. He has to because God's standing behind us with the power and he's given us the authority to hold our hand up and he don't have any choice. And he respects that authority just like you do when that traffic cop holds his hand up. He has to stop, but you got to hold your hand up. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. You don't need to turn there, but I just want to read it to you. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not your power, his power. But you've got the authority. You throw the hand up, and then God's standing right behind you. And the devil's going to do what you say. You hold that hand up, he's going to stop. Uh, John chapter 14 John chapter 14, verses 10 through 15. John chapter 14, verses 10 through 15. See, Jesus told us that he, he had the authority both in heaven and earth were given to him. And he told us to go. He gave us that authority. The reason he did that, so we could do the works he did and greater works, and so that we could reign in this life. And that's the purpose of this authority being transferred. The primary purpose of him going to cross was not so that he could gain power over demons and sickness and death. He already had that before he went to the cross. His purpose in the cross was so that that power and authority could be transferred to us so that we could brought, be brought into right standing with God and be able to get his authority and be able to take this planet back over and all other things subdue the kingdoms. John chapter 14, verse 10 through 15. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verse 12 is the one I want to key on. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Again, the purpose. He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works. All you got to do is read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can see what works he did. From healing the sick and raising the dead, turning water into wine, walking on water, calming storms, you name it. He did a whole, whole lot of things. So you can do it. Because that authority and that power, he died on the cross so that can be transferred to us, that we could be brought into standing in a position of authority to use his authority. Romans chapter 5. I'm just going to read verse 17 here. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Reign in life, that doesn't mean when you get to heaven. That means here, in this life. 
The Amplified Bible says reign as kings in this life. God's plan is for us to rule and reign over circumstances, over poverty, over disease, and everything that will hinder us. And we reign because we have that authority that he gives us. And we're spiritually speaking, positionally speaking, seated at the right hand of the Father, the same place he is, body of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 37, I'll just read it to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than a conqueror. Why? Because of what he's done and the authority that is delegated to us. See, a lot of the preachers, what they preach is the cross religion. They always want to stay at the cross. He didn't stay on a cross. He rose, ascended to the right hand of the Father with all power and all authority. And that's where we need to be looking at ourselves from, not from a cross, a place of death, but from the ascension, a place of power and authority. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 12 tells us who the enemy is. Now keep in mind that we're seated in heavenly places far above all these. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our combat with the devil and all these forces should always be with a consciousness that we have authority over them, that they're under our feet. They're not above us. We have power over them. He's given us the power over them. Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. He's given us that authority. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Go ahead and turn there. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Now, all I'm doing here is showing you your position and what he's giving you. It's up to you to exercise it and take it with you. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Verse 13, hath, past tense, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. That means darkness has no power over you. That means principalities and powers, might, dominion, every name's name, nothing has power over you because he has delivered you from that power and it has no power over you. Now again, I go back. If you don't know that, you can't use it. Knowing it won't help you either unless you use it. You have to, you, you know, people believe in God. Oh, yeah, I believe there's God. He'll do it. He's all powerful and created everything. But you do, you believe God. You believe in him, but do you believe him? Because he's telling you, exactly where you stand. Now, you either do or you don't. I was in prayer the other day, and the Lord told me, he said, I wish my people could call me a liar. Anytime you don't believe what he said, that's what you're doing. You're calling him a liar. I don't believe you, God. You're lying. Uh, you know, you haven't delivered me from the power of darkness. I don't have power over darkness. I don't have power over those things. I'm not above them. You're calling him a liar if you don't believe that, because he's telling you right here, you are. All you got to do is go out there and he back his word. You hold up your hand. He's standing right behind you. And I, the devil ain't, he's going to stop. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. I believe we've already read that one. I'll just read it again. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Colossians tell us, He's delivered us from the power of darkness. It doesn't have any power over us. Luke 10, 19 says, I've given you the power over the enemy. Not only does it not have power over us, we have power over it. You see what I'm saying? Not only does it not control us, we control it. We're above it. We have power over it. Luke 10, 19. Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 15 through 18. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. 
Now, I'm not doing a whole lot of commentary here. The word speaks for itself. You can just follow what it's saying and believe it. Quit calling God a liar. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. And he said unto them, Go you into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. Why? Because they've got power over them. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Why? Because sickness is below your feet. It's a power of darkness. It's a thing of darkness. And darkness has no power over you. He's translated you out of the power of darkness. And given you power over, and given you power or authority over all the power of the enemy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. You don't need to turn there. I'll read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What kind of spirit did he give us? Power. What kind of power? Power over all the power of the enemy. He's delivered us from the power of darkness. He's given us a spirit of power. You see, Faith in God, the fruit of it is peace. Why is there peace? Because you know everything's taken care of. You faith and you believe in God. Doubt, the fruit of it is fear. Because when you're in doubt, you're afraid of what's going to happen. The opposite of faith is unbelief or doubt. The opposite of peace is fear. Don't need to turn here, but 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And he's referring here to evil spirits, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Who's in the world? Satan and all of his hordes, all the demons, sickness, everything he produces. But you're over them. You're above that. You've overcome them. You have overcome them. Not shall, but you have. Now, what do you do with all this power and how do you apply this position? You know where you're standing at, the right hand of the Father, and heavenly places far above all principal and power. You know that the power of darkness has no power over you. That has given you the power over all the enemy. Does it give you a spirit of power? What do you do with it? James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. Here's why Christians that know this nevertheless, are defeated. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. See, the devil's driving down here on you in a, in a car and holding up your hand and stopping him. You're sitting there letting him run over you. That's why. Nobody's resisting him. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. There's an active word there. A thing you got to do. Resist. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. What's he telling you here? Be vigilant. Now, the devil's not a lion, but he goes about like a roaring lion. He tries to scare you. But if you know who you are, you know what power you are, and you know he doesn't have any power, and you know the Right behind you, standing back here, is God. Right behind you. Whatever you say, he's going to do it. He's going to force it. You don't have to be fearful of him. He didn't have any power. He just tries to scare you. Be vigilant. Resist him. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 9. Resist steadfast. Verse 7. Be vigilant. Watch him. Don't let him sneak up on you. Ephesians chapter 4. 
verse 26 through 27. If you just take a complacent attitude walking through life, he'll eat you up. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 27. Ephesians chapter 4, 26 through 27. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Verse 27, the key one. Neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. There's three scriptures there. Resist him and he'll flee from you. Resist him steadfast. Be vigilant. Don't let him sneak up on you. Don't be complacent. Don't give him any place. As soon as you see him coming in, stop him. Hold your hand up. You have the power, you have the authority. He doesn't have any power. He only has what you let him have. He, he throws a bluff on people. That's how he gets anything done. He bluffs them. Because he doesn't have any power. But you, you can just lay down and let him walk right over you, and he will. He'll take advantage of it. Now, how do you resist him? How do you exercise this authority? How? John chapter 14. We read it a while ago. John chapter 14, verses 10 through 15, tells us how. John chapter 14, verses 10 through 15. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall he do also, and greater, greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now that word ask there in the original Greek text means demand. Anything you demand or command in my name, I'm standing right there and I'll do it. In the name of Jesus Christ, sickness be gone. It's going to go. Why? Demand in his name, he'll do it. Sickness has no power. That's a work of darkness. You're delivered from the power of darkness, not from the power, from the power. You're delivered from it. You have power, all power over the enemy. He doesn't have any power. He has to do what you say when you speak it in Jesus' name. Now, I want to make a distinction here between asking God for something in prayer and commanding a thing, okay? Two different things. And this is where some Christians miss it because they're asking God for things. When you get into the book, you'll find there's certain things God's already given you. You know, if I, if I say, give me your hat, and he hands me this hat, and I say, give me your hat, that's kind of stupid because I already got it. Now, I can put it on where it. If I say, give me, if I give you a car and you come to me the next day and say, give me your car, that's kind of stupid. All you got to do is put the key in and start driving it. All right? There's certain things he's given you. All you got to do is start using it. The things that are in here, use them. Don't be asking him for them. R really, you don't ask him to heal you. If you're sick, you don't ask him to heal you. You take authority over the sickness because he's already given you that. By my stripes, you were healed. If you were healed, why are you asking him to heal you? You're already healed. What you gotta do is exercise the authority and the power that he's given you and take authority over it. You got the knowledge, you know what he said? He's God, he cannot lie. If he said it, he will do it. Stand in it, take authority over it, tell it to go. It's gotta go. It has no right. It can't stay there, it can't stand. But you've got to take authority. And there's a difference, demanding and asking. You know, asking is things like, you know, if I'm going to take a job out here or something, I'm going to pray because that's not in his book. I can't, you, you don't say in a certain chapter and verse, Terry Nixon, you take this job over here, at this place over here, okay? That's something I've got to ask him for direction and guidance on because it's not something in the Word. Anything he's got in here he's told you you already got, you don't need to be asking him for it. You need to be taking control of the situation, okay? Because you have the power and you have authority and the enemy doesn't. But he's trying to fool you. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 through 20. And here's another example of how you use this power and authority. What I just talked about, commanding it. Whatever you command in my name, I'll do it. So get out there and start commanding it. But you've got to know what you can command. You get that by going in the Word. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18 through 20, he tells you another thing. And it's again, commanding. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth 
shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Now, what I want to key on is verse 18. Here again, he's telling you an application of your power over the enemy from your positional standpoint at the right hand of the Father. You have all the power. What are you doing? You bind and you loose. Okay? What are you binding and loose? Okay? Let me take it one step. You bind demons, whatever it may be. Certain situations, you will bind them, cast them out. What do you loose? Healing. Loose angels. So you're far above all principal and power. You not only have power over demons and evil spirits, you also have the ability to loose angels in the situations and send them forth. What are they? Ministering spirits who are to minister for those that would be the heirs of salvation. What is ministering? That means going out and doing something for you. Ministering either to you or to someone else. How do you do it? Loose them. Command them forth in the name of Jesus. They have to follow your direction also. Didn't Jesus say, I could call down 12 legions of angels? And he gave you the same thing. People don't use it because they don't know it. Mark 11, 22 through 24. Here again, how to apply your power and your authority. Mark 11, verses 22 through 24. This is also the highest form of faith. Mark 11, verses 22 through 24. I believe it's Romans 1, 17, I think, that says we go from faith to faith out of one faith into a higher faith. And there's different levels of faith. This one, not really different levels. Everybody's given the measure. You've got all the faith you ever have in you, but it's your ability to release it. How are you growing in that? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. The more you get into the word and understand it, comprehend it, have a relationship with God, the more that faith's going to be released. You've got all you ever have, but you've got to learn how to release it. Mark 11, 22 through 24. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Some of you in your... Uh, Bible there will have, have the faith of God. I'm telling you, most powerful kind of faith. For verily say unto you, whosoever shall say, whosoever shall say, not whosoever shall pray, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, I want to key. If that ain't praying, that's saying. That's the commanding. Remember I talked earlier about the petitioning, prayer, asking God for things. But when he's given you something, you say it. You command it forth. Now, he's saying here he's using the example of a mountain. But I could say, uh, it, it, what he's talking about believing here is that believe that what you say will come to pass. Whatever it is you're going to say. If I say, you know, flag be moved over here, as long as I believe what I say, that flag will move over there. It's believing what you say. And how can you believe that? Because he's telling you, if you know what his will is, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know his will, okay? You know what his will is. You know your right to it then. And you can stand in a position. You know your authority. You know the enemy has no authority. Speak it. In faith, it has to happen. But you say it. You don't pray it. Now, this is commanding things to occur. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. You don't need to turn there. That says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies a footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits? sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salva salvation. And in NIV it says, all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. They're sent to serve you. That's why I'm saying you don't only have the power of the enemy, but you're far above all principality and power. Every name that's named, that means the good angels too. You can loose them and send them to help people. I want to tell you a story that I heard Kenneth Hagin talk about he said one time that, and this will give you an example of a situation in which you need to just take authority over it. He said he was having a vision. Jesus appeared to him, and he talked to him for about an hour and a half. Then Jesus was talking to him, and all of a sudden this little bitty demon about the size of a monkey come jumping in there 
and a big cloud of smoke came up and he said he couldn't couldn't see Jesus anymore and he couldn't make out what he was saying he could still hear him talking but he couldn't make it out and the little demon was jumping up and down and going yakety 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 and he couldn't hear Jesus and he, and he said I was sitting there and he said I was thinking why ain't Jesus doing nothing about that don't you know I can't hear him and finally he just got mad and he said in the name of Jesus Christ you shut up and that demon just fell to the ground like a whoop pup and started wimping around and he said in the name of Jesus get out of here and it left and as soon as it did, the cloud cleared, and he could hear Jesus again. And he was asking Jesus, why didn't you do something about that? He said, I couldn't. Hagen said, I, I thought, did you say you wouldn't? He said, no. He said, I couldn't. He said, I give you the power over him. You had to command him to go. And he learned a lot from that little incident right there. Jesus won't do things he's already given you the power to do. It's up to you to exercise that power. That's why so many people, you wonder why people are in sickness and why these things happen, because they're not exercising authority. And it comes from, you know, God's grace and his mercy. When you're first born again, he'll do things for you just like you would a baby. He's going to help you along and do things, but he expects you to grow up. There comes a point he expects you to know what's in the book and know what your rights are and to start using it. You know, you've you got to get out of the pamper someday. I'll just throw a few more angel scriptures out to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3 says, Know ye not that ye shall judge angels. Matthew 26, verses 52 through 53 is the scripture in which he said, uh, Jesus said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to the Father, and he will presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Now, I want to show you some scriptural examples of exercising this authority. And I want you to follow along with me. Acts chapter 9, verse 32. Acts chapter 9, verse 32 through 34. First, I'm going to go into the apostles. Then I'm going to go back to Jesus so I can show you that it's not only him, the way he did it, it's the way the apostles did it also. And it's the way we should, we're to do it. Acts chapter 9, verse 32, 30, 32 through 34. And it came to pass... As Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he rose immediately. He didn't pray. He said, unto him Jesus Christ maketh thee whole arise he commanded it and what did he do he rose immediately alright that was over an infirmity or sickness or disease whatever he commanded it took authority over it Acts chapter 3 verses 1 through 16 Acts chapter 3 verse 1 through 16 there's a whole lot of examples of this in the Bible I'm just going to hit a few of them here so you can kind of see how it goes Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through 16. Very familiar one. Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through 16. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, and they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask on alms and alms. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave him, gave, gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I ha have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto them. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in, in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or well, why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? 
the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of y'all. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He didn't pray. He took authority over the problem the man had. In the name of Jesus. What did Jesus say? Whatsoever you should demand or command in my name, I'll do it. What did he do here? He commanded in his name, and what did he do? Jesus did it. He raised him up. Even Peter said it wasn't our power, but it was that authority of that name faith in his name. Mark chapter 4, verse 36 through 41, an example of Jesus, same thing. Mark chapter 4, verse 36 through 41. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Again, all power. Not only over the enemy, here he had power over nature. Buked the wind, all he did was spoke. He didn't pray to the Father, he just commanded it. What, I mean, from the very beginning, what did he have it tell us? Have dominion. Have dominion. Save your time looking here, I'll read these to you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 10 through 13. Matthew chapter 12, verse 10 through 13. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much, then, is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and was restored whole like as the other. Didn't pray. Just told him. Stretch it forth. Now, I can picture this guy probably couldn't even stretch it for us. He was like this. Well, he told him. He was healed instantly. Luke, chapter 7, verse 11 through 15. Luke 7, 11 through 15. That's, and, and here, this is an example here of not the faith of the recipient being the thing that heals you. And none of these are. None of these are the faith of the recipient. These are the faith of the man speaking the words. Luke, because a dead man can't have faith. Luke 7, 11 through 15. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city were with, was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the buyer, and they that bear him stood still. Okay, now this is a funeral possession coming down through here. And they're carrying it up on, the, on their shoulders, and he's stopping the funeral possession. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he was delivered him to his mother. Didn't pray. And it sure wasn't a dead man's faith that got him up. But dead, dead men don't have no faith. And all he said was, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. Commanding, took authority over death. Death is a power of darkness. If you can receive it, we have power over death. And there will be a people that live and, and exercise it and walk in it. Life. Mark chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. Mark chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. I'll read it to you. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and there them that wept and wailed greatly. And, he, and when he was come in, he saith unto them, 
Why make you this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Thalitha Kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. No prayer, authority over death. Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. That's all he said. See, sometimes we get to praying for people and we'll go on for five minutes. Oh, no, no, no. You don't have to speak but just a few words. Take authority over the situation. I just want to remind you of, to me, one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he give him Jesus, let him die for us, why wouldn't he do all these other things for us? That's how much he loves us. He gave his own son. Surely he'll heal your sicknesses and your diseases and prosper you. That's a great scripture. Hmm. Here I'm going to give you just a few scriptures of the things that he's already given us that you should be using authority and commanding instead of petitioning. And I'll read them. You don't have to turn there because I'm running a long time. First Peter 2:24. Mentioned it earlier, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. You were healed. You were healed. You were healed. But don't ask him to heal you. Command the sickness to leave. Third John, chapter 1, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things I must prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. Again, I'm showing you here a different level. You're sick, you get healed. Lowest level, medium level. Be in health. Be in health means you don't get sick. Okay? And then there's divine life where you not only don't get sick, but you heal others. One of the most important scriptures in the Bible regarding your rights. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. Galatians 3, 13 through 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written... Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, if you want to know what all that encompasses, then you just take a look at chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 28. A long chapter, but it shows you the curse of the law. Now, that means that everything that's in there, every curse that's mentioned in there, He's already redeemed you from. And you shouldn't be asking him for those things. You should be commanding them out of your life if they're in your life. If the, if the evil devil comes up one of those things and one of those things tries to attach to you, hold your hand up in the name of Jesus Christ. Out of here. Okay? Let me just list a few of them. These are things that you should take authority over. Curses in the city, curses in the field, curses on your fruit and your bread, the curse of a barren womb, curses upon your crops, curses upon the fertility of your cattle and flocks, curses when you come in, curses when you go out. The Lord himself will send his personal curses upon you. You'll be confused and a failure in everything you do until at last you're destroyed because of the sin of forsaking him. He will send disease among you until you are destroyed from the face of the land you're about to enter and possess. He will send tuberculosis, fever, infections, plague, and war, he will blight your crops, covering them with mildew. All these devastations shall pursue you until you perish. The heavens above you will be an unyielding as bronze, and the earth beneath will be as iron. The land will become as dry as the dust for lack of rain, and dust storms shall destroy you. The Lord will cause you to be defeated by your enemies. You will march out to battle gloriously, but flee before your enemies in utter confusion, and you will be tossed to and fro among all the nations of the earth. Your dead bodies will be food to the birds and wild animals, and no one will be there to chase them away. He will send upon you the Egyptian boil, tumors, scurvy, itch, for none of which he, there shall be a remedy. He will send madness, blindness, fear, and panic upon you. 
You will grope in the bright sunlight just as the blind man gropes in darkness. You should not prosper in anything you do. You'll be oppressed and robbed continually and nothing will save you. Someone else will marry your fiancé. Someone else will live in the house you build. Someone else will eat the fruit of the vineyard you plant. Your oxen shall be butchered before your eyes, but you won't get a single bite of the meat. Your donkeys will be driven away as you watch and will never return to you again. Your sheep will be given to your enemies, and there will be no one to protect you. You will watch as your sons and daughters are taken away as slaves. Your heart will be break with a longing for them, but you will not be able to help them. A foreign nation you have not even heard of will eat the crops you will have worked so hard to grow. You will always be oppressed and crushed. You will go mad because of all the tragedy you see around you. The Lord will cover you with the boils from head to foot. He will exile you, and the king you will choose to a na- the king you will choose to a nation to whom neither you nor your ancestors gave a second thought. And while in exile, you shall worship gods of wood and stone. You will become an object of horror, a proverb, and a by- byword among all the nations. For the Lord will thrust you away. You will sow much but reap little. For the locusts will eat your crops. You will plant vineyards and care for them, but you won't eat the grapes or drink the wine. For the worms will destroy the vines. All the trees will be growing everywhere, but there won't be enough olive oil to anoint yourselves. For the trees will drop their fruit before it is matured. Your sons and your daughters will be snatched away from you as slaves. The locusts shall destroy your trees and vines. Foreigners living among you shall become richer and richer while you become poorer and poorer. They shall lend to you. They shall lend to you, not you to them. They shall be the head, you shall be the tail. All these curses shall pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed. All because you refuse to listen to the Lord your God. These horrors shall befall you and your descendants as a warning. You will become slaves to your enemies because of your failure to praise God for all that he has given you. The Lord will send your enemies against you and you will be hungry, thirsty, naked, and want of everything. And yoke of iron shall be placed around your neck until you are destroyed. The Lord will bring a distant nation against you, swooping down upon you like an eagle, a nation whose language you don't understand, a nation of fierce and angry men who will have no mercy upon your young or old. They will eat you out of house and home, until your cattle and crops are gone, your grain, new wine, oil, olive oil, calves, and lambs will all disappear. The nation will lay siege to your cities and knock you down, knock down your highest walls. And it goes on and on here. That's all the curse. And he's redeemed you from every bit of it. And any of that, in that list, just look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. And if any of that's in your life, start commanding it out. Because it's got some good blessings in there too, because that's the blessing that Abraham mentioned in there also. You're redeemed from the curse of the law. Half redeemed us. Half redeemed us, past tense. You don't need to be praying for those things in your life. You need to take authority over the enemy and his, the things he produces. That's all things he produces. And you have authority over it because God said you did. So don't call him a liar. Start exercising your authority. God bless you. appreciate your time. I guess you're free to go.